I'm Mike Liddell Taylor, or at least, that's what my mother said I was called when she gave me to the orphanage, when I was that big, or it might have been that big. Well, it was probably that big. I haven't grown much since. Anyway, never mind all that. What we're presenting to you today, and yesterday, and the day before, and the month before, because it's taken ages to make this program, is a videotape, a film, a major production on the keeping and breeding of African greys and the Pyocephalus group in captivity. I'll say that again, the Pyocephalus group. It took me ages to learn that as well, but nevertheless, I seem to have done it. So, hopefully you'll enjoy it as much as we have in making it. So, I'll ask Phil, my cameraman, now to fade me out and we'll carry on with the show. In 1989, I wrote a short article for what was soon to be a forgotten magazine, Special Interest, produced and published by Peter Nash, ex-bank robber and would-be Cray Twins associate. Uh, this is what I said. Apart from the budgerigar and possibly the cockatiel, both inhabitants of Australia, the African Grey is almost certainly the most recognised member of the parrot family. Indeed, this is a bird with royal connections, a grey having been the pet of Mary, Duchess of Richmond, a mistress of Charles II for over 40 years. This bird did not survive long after her death in 1702 and, as she had requested, was preserved with her effigy. Now nearly 300 years old, it can be seen to this day in the Norman Undercroft Museum at Westminster Abbey. Another royal bird fancier to own an African grey was, of course, Henry VIII. Though not as spectacular in colour as many of its relations, such as the macaws from South America or the gaudy parakeets of Australia, what the grey lacks in flamboyance it makes up for in intelligence and outstanding ability to imitate human speech. Approximately 31 to 37 centimetres in length, its plumage is silver grey overall, darker at the edges of the nape and breast with scarlet tail feathers. The bill is black, feet are grey and the eyes of adult birds bright yellow. In the subspecies, commonly known as the Timnay grey, Main differences are smaller size and darker body, with maroon tail and horn-coloured upper mandibill. These command considerably lower prices and are sometimes sold by unscrupulous dealers as baby silvers, but they will equal the talking ability of their more majestic cousins. The natural habitat of African greys is mostly lowland forest, where they feed upon nuts, fruits and berries occasionally venturing out into cultivated fields of maize. Their favourite food is the fruit of the oil palm. In captivity, they thrive on a mixture of oats, flake maize, peanuts, safflower, sunflower, corn on the cob, 
fruits and greens. As its name implies, the species originates from Africa and was imported into the UK for many years. Nowadays, with the increasing worldwide restrictions on the movement of livestock, several aviculturists have set up breeding programs in Britain. Offspring are taken from the parent bird at about eight days and hand-reared with feeds every two hours, including nights. This continues for 12 to 14 weeks. Hand-reared birds cost twice as much as specimens caught in the wild, which rarely adjust to captive life. Obtained young, they will make delightful companions, starting to talk at only 12 weeks and living as long as 70 years. Adult greys cannot be visually sexed with any reliability. However, veterinary science can now solve the problem with an endoscope. Would-be breeders used to endure years of frustration when two birds of the same sex formed a bond and acted in every way like a natural pair. The endoscope is a fibre optic tube which allows internal examination of the birds to determine the presence of either testes or ovaries. It is also used to check the parrot's maturity and general health. Well cared for, the African grey is surely the most enduring and entertaining of all companion animals. Amazing! So now I'm back in the day clothes. Let's go and look at some birds. This way. Though vast in size, the African continent has, apart from the love birds, only 10 species of parrot, eight of which feature in this program. The largest at 13 inches and most recognisable of these is the grey, of which two races exist. The more familiar to both pet and aviary owner is that frequently described as the silver. The overall body colour of the grey varies from region to region, with males generally tending to be darker, but in all cases the nominate race sports a bright red tail. In some specimens, Considerable amounts of red and pink feathers can be found scattered across the breast and these birds are frequently referred to as king greys. Albino and totally pink birds have also been reported. Habitat of the grey in the wild state covers southeastern parts of the Ivory Coast to western Kenya and northern Angola, the Congo from whence the largest specimens originate and northwestern Tanzania. Now, bred in ever-increasing numbers within aviculture, the grey lays between three to five eggs in a clutch, which, providing fertile, will hatch between 28 and 30 days. The truth is that greys are a truly wonderful subject for anyone contemplating keeping and breeding the larger parrots. Not only are adult pairs reasonably priced and freely available, but a single chick will repay the initial investment and, Better still, demand for hand-raised babies has never been greater. All that applies to its larger and to some more attractive relative also is true of the smaller and darker Timnay Grey. This bird will make an equally tame and confiding pet. Pink examples of this bird have also been recorded. Eggs laid and incubation times are as for the nominate race. Formerly quite rare in collections, it is today freely available and being bred by an ever increasing number of keepers. Like many parrots with sombre plumage, the current price commanded is far less than that for its larger and more attractive relative, although in character and personality there is little to distinguish the two. Timnays inhabit Sierra Leone, Southern Guinea, Liberia and the Ivory Coast. I just love this nine and a half inch dwarf member of the parrot family and have been keeping and breeding them for years. As with most African parrots, they represent a phenomenal investment, a hand-reared baby fetching up to four times the cost of an adult. Three races exist. The main difference 
being in the colour of the abdomen, the more generally available having bright yellow, the other two red or orange. Distribution of this species ranges through Ghana, the Ivory Coast, Nigerian Cameroon and southwest Chad. In captivity, they lay between three to four eggs in a clutch. Incubation lasts for 28 days, though in my own facility, 24 days has been recorded. As with all African parrots, breeding activity is most likely to occur in the UK during winter months. In spite of ever-increasing import restrictions, the Senegal remains probably the most freely available of all true parrots, a worthwhile and rewarding Cajun Avery subject nevertheless. Like other members of the Pyocephalus group, the Nine Inch Myers parrot has recently become the focus of some enthusiasm from the bird keeping fraternity. Regular breeding successes are now being recorded and their existence within aviculture should now be assured. The wild distribution of this species is reasonably widespread, covering Uganda, Western Tanzania, Kenya, Zambia, Angola, and the Southwest Africa. In my own facility, pairs bred in a flight just 24 inches by 24 inches by 36 inches long, laying three eggs and hatching their chicks at 27 days. One of the less well-known and available of its group, the Rupels is nevertheless a worthwhile and desirable addition to any collection. Sexual dimorphism is said to exist, the female being more brightly coloured than the male. Breeding activity has been recorded as taking place in all months of the year, though more usually towards December. Three to four eggs are produced in a clutch, with hatching taking place at 28 days. Wild distribution is restricted to Southwest Africa and Angola. Due to its dull coloration, this parrot has never achieved great popularity. Indeed, when available, it has been offered at even less than the Senegal, a species to which it bears great similarity in size, if not colour. Availability dictated by demand could see this bird disappear from aviculture altogether, though hopefully this will not be the case. It is common within its wild range, which includes Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Tanzania and Kenya. Reports indicate two eggs in a clutch to be the norm, hatching at 26 to 28 days. Almost certainly, the most distinctive of the Pyocephalus group, the red belly parrot originating from Ethiopia, Tanzania and Somalia, is without doubt one of the most desirable of the group. In size, it mirrors its common relative, the Senegal, but unlike the latter, can be sexed when adult easily by the eye. The cock sports deep red orange on the abdomen and lower breast, replacing the female by bluish green. A rarity within aviculture until the early 80s, today a good number of pairs exist in aviaries worldwide. Though still reasonably scarce, these birds are, when available, far more reasonably priced than, say, the cakes from South America, a species of similar size and attractiveness. My own pairs tend to lay three eggs in a clutch, though on occasion four have been recorded. Hatching takes place at 28 days and the chicks wean and leave the nest at 12 weeks. Three races of this bird appear to exist, but vary only in the amount of red appearing on its head or the bend of the wing. Here we are featuring the nominate race. Jardines are attractive birds and have recently begun to receive from aviculturists the attention they so richly deserve. It is an interesting fact that throughout the 1980s, dealers in Africa frequently gave these birds as an inducement to customers when buying African greys, or at worst, charged one pound a bird. I doubt this is a practice continued today. The third largest at 11 inches of the Pyocephalus group, the Jardines will make, when hand-reared, an interesting and less expensive alternative to its countrymen than the grey, 
but its talking ability is, it must be said, somewhat limited. A forest dweller, the Jardines, inhabits Central Africa, Angola, Kenya and northern Tanzania. In captivity, a clutch of three to four eggs is laid, hatching at 26 days. The Cape Parrot from southeastern Africa, western Zululand, western Swaziland and eastern Transvaal is a rare, expensive and much sought after member of its group. It is also at 12 inches the largest. A small number of these birds were imported into the UK in the early 1990s, though unfortunately most proved to be males. Nevertheless, a good number of pairs are now breeding both in the UK and elsewhere. As with its smaller relatives, the Cape will go to nest at almost any time of the year, laying clutches of three to four eggs, which again hatch at 28 days. Capes can be sexed visually when adult, the hen having a completely red forehead, whereas in the male, this coloration is slight, or in some specimens, almost non-existent. The most important aspect of housing greys and all African parrots set up for breeding is the location of the aviary or flight cage. Greys are secretive birds and require a great deal of privacy both from other pairs and their human keepers. Here we see a traditional type of enclosure suitably located away from other birds and heavy keeper traffic. The double unit is divided with a galvanised steel panel which not only separates the pairs, but prevents them from seeing each other. The basic construction is of three by two inch tantalized timber panels and 16 gauge by half by half mesh. Old railway sleepers have been used as a base, negating the costly alternative of brickwork. Again, 16 gauge half by half mesh has been laid on the earth floor to prevent access by vermin, then being covered with gravel to provide an easy to clean and pleasant looking floor area. Each compartment incidentally measures six feet long, four feet wide and just six feet high. Nowadays however, most serious breeders of greys and the pyocephalus group are housing their birds indoors. Indeed, these birds, without exception, will breed readily in the smallest cage located in the spare bedroom. Here, however, we are investigating some more preferable alternatives. My own favourite is this 6x3x3 all-wire flight, hung from roof supports by galvanised chain. It is easy to keep clean, relatively simple to construct and very cost effective. Once again, as you see, a privacy divider is provided. Note also the way in which the food bowl basket has been cut and affixed to prevent the birds from turning over their food bowls and water bowls. Above the unit is a sprinkler system, which provides the birds at the flick of a tap with essential artificial rain. Though in truth, most greys leg it into the nest box as soon as the system is activated. Obviously, where the flight cage is located in a basement or spare room, a hand spray would be more suitably employed. Another idea is this cube on wheels, which I suppose would allow you to take your birds for a walk in the park if so desired. The slide-out tray, of course, prevents soiling of the floor beneath and provides a more suitable unit for the indoor breeder than the all-wire hung flight. Though not commercially available, any small fabrication company will be able to construct one for you by watching this video. Lastly, the box with a view. Again, made to order and of all metal construction, slide out trays and swing feeders. At only 36 inches by 24 inches from end to the divider, these units will be viewed by many as incredibly small but for a major UK breeder of greys, they proved immensely successful. Nevertheless, my own opinion is that they are more suited to the smaller members of the group, such as Senegals, Jardines and Red-Bellied. Again, they provide the ideal unit 
for the spare room breeder. Nest boxes for all members of the Pyocephalus group follow the same pattern of construction, the only difference being size. Greys and Cape parrots are happy with a nesting chamber 12 inches by 12 inches by 24 inches, whilst all other members of the group vote for one approximately 9 inches by 9 inches by 24 inches. Variable, but that's my guide. Nesting material is simply clean shavings, but I do tack lumps of 2x2 two two sawn timber to the inside of the boxes to give the birds something other than the box to chew on and to provide stimulus. Finally, two further points. Try where possible to use only stainless steel bowls. Not only do these provide virtually indestructible, but are easy to maintain in a sterilised and clean condition. Ours are put in the dishwasher or soaked for 20 minutes in Milton solution prior to a hot soapy wash. Perches are important and let's face it, where your birds will spend most of their time. Our preferred types are willow, pear, apple, oak or chestnut, always fresh and graduated in size to exercise the feet of your birds. Under no circumstances use plastic piping or metal. It's the lazy keeper's option. A point here. If you keep your birds in outside aviaries with earth floors, chances are periodical worming will be necessary. In any event, new birds to your collection should always be treated. Better safe than sorry. The simplest and best method is by taking away the water for one day then giving a mixture of biazine by water for the next three. Hey presto, job done and no stress to your birds. Use the same formula also when hand rearing chicks taken from outside flights. In this case simply add the biazine by water to the hand feeding diet for the same period as for the adults. Diets for greys vary greatly, but my own experience tells me that these birds, like all parrots, will, given the opportunity, enjoy variety. Pellets are an ever more promoted easy option and do have the advantage that they offer a totally balanced and nutritionally correct diet. However, easy options have never been my own idea for the keeping or breeding of any species in a domestic environment. Since my own success in keeping and breeding African parrots has been considerable, which is one reason you've bought this tape. Let's now, once again, go live to the studio and watch Optimus III in action. African greys and the Pyocephalus group are very picky eaters. No question of it. Um, whatever you give them, they'll try and avoid it unless it's a bit of sunflower. So what you've got to do is you've got to trick them into taking a much more varied diet. My own method is to give them uh, a fruit and vegetable kind of mix in the morning and then in the afternoon to give them the other things I really want them to eat. Now, when we come to talking about fruit and vegetable, uh, here we've got a lovely cocktail. It's got all sorts of lovely things in it. And that's the kind of bowl of uh, goodies I would give them probably about nine o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, whenever you get up. And you can see here what we've got in there. We've got some uh, bananas. I think they're bananas, very nice. Uh, we've got some uh, apples. We've got some uh, beetroot. This is natural beetroot, by the way. Uh, it's not cooked and uh, quite nice. Give it a wash off first, of course, and then dice it up. Uh, you've got carrot. Greys particularly like carrots, and whatever people say about greys not eating fruit and vegetables and so forth, it's not particularly true. It, it is important they have these things. Naturally enough, you can give them cabbage. Um, in this particular instant, instance, I'll say that again, instance, this is a miniature cabbage because this is a sprout, but they'll also enjoy that as well. And the other thing you can give them is something like this, which I'll just sort of break a bit off here. Um, that's also very good because that's green leaf 
and obviously there's lots of iron in there. I could have some myself, but I'll try and avoid it. So in the morning, as I say, give them a nice mixture like that. And if you're home during the day, you can take that away and replace it with the other mixture I'm now going to explain to you. But if not, don't worry, because you can mix the whole thing together or give it all in one go. OK. Now, the tra traditional situation is to feed your African greys or any parrots you keep with a particular sort of seed, vegetable, stroke, beans, pulses type of mix. This is what I do. I use uh, one part of this, which is flaked maize. Um, I use one part of sunflower. You'll notice that this particular sunflower is hulled because we don't want all those shells falling on the floor. Not very nice anyway. And this particular stuff comes from whole food wholesalers. So it's obviously for human consumption and of the very best quality. We'll move over here a little bit, sweeping my hands, and we'll see what we've got here is pine nuts. Pine nuts, birds particularly enjoy. Very good, one part of that. Obviously, the favorite peanuts. These peanuts, again, are shelled so that we don't have a problem with shells uh, you know, suffering from mould and so forth, which may or may not have been badly stored. We can't really tell, but some peanuts as well. And over here, we've got mixed millets. Not a lot of people use mi mixed millets, but I find my birds quite enjoy them. And finally, with that particular mix, we use some safflower. Safflower is rather good because it's uh, of a l uh, far greater, less... Uh, fat content than say something like sunflower. Sunflower, you only want about 10% in your in your entire um, entire uh, food. So there we oh whoop, there we are some safflower there. Mix that all up together, and what we end up with is something like that. And what we do then is we'll pull that into there, and then we'll move over here to our bean mix, and in our bean mix, we'll use some chickpeas, we'll use some black-eyed uh, beans or peas, we'll use some soya, we'll use some mung beans, and we'll use some aduki beans. This is my particular mix that I use. There are other alternatives, but this is my particular favorite. And we'll mix that all up together to end up with something like that. Now, once we've done that, what we actually do is we put that into something like this, which is an old sweet jar, and um, we'll soak that over a 24-hour period. Once we've actually soaked that, what we do is we rinse it very, very thoroughly, and then we lay it on a tray where it will, uh, in, in, a, in a warm, dark room, where it will actually sprout and end up looking a bit like that, so you can get something Look at that little thing. It looks like a tadpole. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, the nice thing about that is that that is actually a living enzyme. It's absolutely essential for your birds. Once you've done that, you put that back into here again. And as you'll notice, that's all been drilled through here. Ideal if you're a bit of a DIY specialist. Um, rinse it again. Soak it off and really rinse it thoroughly. And when you've done that, We'll just take that lid off there, and what we'll do is we'll use something like this. Now, this is obviously available in, in England and um, the UK in general, probably in the whole of Europe. In America, it may be possible to have something different, but what this is really is a sterilizing fluid. It's used for cleaning up baby, um, baby bowls and all that sort of thing. But we'll take a little bit of that, put that in there, pop it into there, and leave that for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, you take the beans again, rinse them really thoroughly, restore them back into your bowl or into any other container, and those beans will be fine to be kept for at least three or four days, even longer in your refrigerator. However, what we'll assume at the moment is we've followed those procedures. Put that back on there like that. Very good. And here are my specially prepared Milton sterilized beans. 
and I will add those into this mix like so. Wonderful that, isn't it? There we are. There we go. Mix that all round. This gives me a semi-wet, semi-dry mix, however you kind of want to look at the situation. And what we'll then do with that is we'll add to it some Pet Chef. The reason I use Pet Chef is that the man who invented Pet Chef, which is uh, an, an, an additional nutritional uh, situation, is that this was invented by the man who bred the most African greys in the UK ever. And what we'll do is we'll then can sprinkle that on top of there, which means that the birds can't avoid actually taking this mineral and, uh, yes, breed a supplement. There we are. I paused for a moment there, but I'm allowed for a pause because I need a pause while I'm having a glass of red wine. Everybody knows I like a glass of red wine, which is probably why I paused. So I'll have a little pause. Mm. Very good. Had the pause. Now, as you can see from that, with this semi-wet and dry mix, that powder has adhered or stuck to this mixture. And there you go. Whack that in. The birds will love it. No problem at all. And they'll get all the nutrients and the minerals and vitamins that they possibly need. So there we are. That's how you do it. So just recapping on that, feed your birds the veg vegetables <coughs> and fruits and so forth in the morning because they'll be hungry in the morning, therefore they'll be more uh, keen to take whatever's offered to them. Don't forget your, your bits of carrot. Carrot's very good for them, carotene and so forth. An apple, particularly the beetroot, fresh beetroot, remember. And then take that away in the afternoon, come back and give them this wonderfully nutritious diet. And there we are. Right, let's talk about baby diets. Now, uh, self-raising baby parrots is a completely different subject. It's a very in-depth and uh, rather expanded subject, which fortunately is covered by my own tape here. Self-raising baby parrots. Self-raising, an Americanism. Very good for you and American viewers. But we won't worry about that. Nuff said that if you're going to hand-raise your baby chicks, there are a number of uh, diets available on the market today. Now, one of the very good ones is this one here called Tropican Breeding Diet. Wonderful. And that comes from someone called Hagen. On the back of there, you'll find, uh, oh, it's even in French. Fantastic. You'll find lots of uh, uh, information and uh, all the necessary instructions in, uh, you know, how to mix it and so on and so forth. But in fact, sometimes that, uh, this particular mixture may not be available. And if it isn't available, this is an alternative I suggest you. What you do is you take four parts of this, which is a wonderful thing. Looks, looks nice, doesn't it? This is called monkey chow, or primate diet. And you take four parts of that, and you soak it overnight, uh, which I've done here. Here we are. We have some soaked monkey chow. And you add that to one part of something called three-nut butter. Um, this, in fact, is a, is a peanut butter, but what you want is a three-nut butter. And one part of that, one part of the monkey chow, and then you add to that uh, one part of Heinz pure fruit. Now, you don't have to use Heinz pure fruit. You could, in fact, uh, have put some you know, actual fresh fruit into your blender, blended it up, and done the same thing. And when you've done that, you mix that all into a, a bowl, ideally having blended it first in your blender, which you won't do now because it will blow the, I won't say that word, uh, ears off my uh, sound cameraman. Put it in there, transfer it back into there, and you'll get that sort of mixture like that. And what I recommend then is uh, that you put in some acidophilus. Acidophilus will uh, promote friendly bacteria in the gut. So you simply take one of these little capsules, which we'll do like that, just sprinkle it over there. Oh, lovely. Looking forward to this. Throw that away. Give that a shake round, and away you go. Then in with your syringe. In with my syringe. And away we are, ready to feed our baby chicks, which we don't have here today, but we might have. And away you go. 
simple and uh, very straightforward alternative if you can't get a ready mixed diet. And there we are. And now I'm going to go away and have a little rest before we do the next section. Thank you very much, Philip. See you later. Today, of course, a number of correctly balanced hand-rearing diets are available. With all of these, it's simply a matter of mixing the powder with boiled, but not boiling water, to the required consistency, and hey presto, away you go. The use of these diets and our own chicks, however, produced what appeared to be blood in the urates. Tests proved this not to be the case, and this phenomena appears to be as a result of a water-soluble pigment being eliminated from the faces. An interesting in-depth examination of the likely causes of this problem may be found and explained by Dr. Susan Club in the book Cytosine Aviculture, section 16, page 17. As with all parrots, the key to breeding success with greys and the pyocephalus group is compatibility. Forced pairing, like arranged marriages, doesn't always lead to resounding success. So, if after at the most two years mating has not occurred, be prepared to change mates. Though African parrots generally breed during the winter in the UK, I have experienced success with certain pairs throughout the year, whether housed in outside flights or on an inside situation with a controlled environment. For sure, domestically bred specimens will go to nest earlier than their wild caught counterparts. But in all cases, most, if not all African parrots are capable of breeding at around three years of age. My own experience is, however, that birds of five to six years of age are more likely to reproduce. Of course, sooner or later, Hopefully sooner, an egg will appear. And when it does, one faces the dilemma of what to do next. In my own experience, all African grey parrots make great parents and will successfully rear their own young. Though, of course, these will not have the same confiding nature as a hand-reared specimen. Most greys and other members of this group are today taken from the parents shortly after hatch, and hand-reared to produce tame and confiding birds for the pet market. A good thing too, since this reduces the demand for wild-caught specimens. Ideally, chicks should be taken from the parents at about eight days from hatch, since the adult birds will give their offspring a better start than we humans can so far emulate. Even if you do decide to incubate your eggs, they are best set by the parents and taken away at about the same period, that is, at around eight to 10 days. Again, incubation is a complex subject, though in general, not nearly as mysterious as some breeders would have you believe. Only when problems arrive do we need to call out the heavy brigade. And in this respect, because we don't have 50 hours of film or the budget available, grab a copy of Rick Jordan's Parrot Incubation Procedures. What this book doesn't reveal, God hasn't yet invented. Take care when removing eggs from the natural nest, as in general, the parents will not view this activity with cooperation. An egg gauntlet, as seen here, is a useful barrier in preventing amputation. Once the egg or eggs have been safely recovered, they should be gently cleaned, only if found to be soiled, with lukewarm water before being placed in the incubator. Speed in this activity is essential, since chilling of the egg can easily kill the living embryo within. Lastly, if you do elect to take chicks for ham rearing, it's a good idea to leave them to rear at least one hatchling themselves in any one season, for both psychological and physical reasons. African greys and most, though not all, members of the pyocephalus group cannot be sexed by eye, 
whatever the experts or books will try to tell you. There are only three ways of being 100% sure of the true sex of a majority of parrot species. The first is to shake the bird, and if it rattles, it's a boy. If it doesn't, it's a girl. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Very funny. Seriously, we have to look to DNA testing or surgical sexing to reliably determine gender. DNA is fine and a safe way specifically to investigate the sex of young birds, requiring only a small sample of blood to be taken from a clip claw and sent to the laboratory for analyses. However, the method I have employed for many successful years and still do is endoscopy. Not only because this minor surgical procedure enables the experienced veterinarian to visually view and determine the sexual organs without doubt, but also because other vital life support and reproductive organs can be examined at the same time. Various other essential procedures can also be completed during this activity. So, let's go live now with my favourite tame and talking pet vet, Andrew Greenwood, to the studio. That's lovely. Right, we'll just turn up the anaesthetic, induce the bird. It's a very quick process with the uh, isoflurane, which is what we're using right. nowadays for birds. Very rapid induction, very smooth, safe anaesthesia and very rapid recovery. Just pluck a few feathers away on the left flank. The back so, of the rib. So first of all, what we're doing here Excuse is me. to carry out surgical sexing, in fact. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And we always do this on the left side because the f in the female, the ovary, 99 times out of 100 or probably more, only develops on the left side. Right. So um, that's clearly the approach to take. Let's make a small stab incision here, behind the last rib, into the air sac in the abdomen. Turn up the light and take this uh, endoscope and just insert it through this small flank hole straight into the abdomen there. And we can see the gonad quite clearly over this bird. It is a female and um, it's mature, active, Ready to go, really. Lovely. Now, as we've already got an incision here, we'll put the microchip in through the same hole up there above the ribs and just push it home. What's the purpose of the microchip? The purpose of the microchip is to identify the bird uh, permanently. There's a readable number in there. Right. And, it, of course, nowadays it's a great... Uh, bonus against theft, a, a good protection against theft. Right. I'll just pick out the reader and make sure that one's reading all right. There's the number. Right. Is that, can, can someone copy that number or? No, they can't. They're randomly generated numbers. There, are, there is unfortunately more than one microchip system and they have all slightly different configurations of numbers. Right. And they're not necessarily compatible with one another but um, each number is individual, uh, isn't repeated, and can't be um, copied or altered in any way once the microchip is inside the bird. Mm. And we just put a single dissolving stitch into this small wound. I've noticed that some veterinarians that uh, one has worked with in the past don't actually stitch the bird up. Why, why do you stitch the birds up? I just like, it's, although it's a very, very small hole, it does actually go into the air sac system of the bird and I just like to have it closed just for the sake of half a minute so dust and bacteria and things can't get in until it heals which it does very quickly in a couple of days. Right. So that's that finished. Now we'll identify the bird from the outside for you by putting on a coloured ring. These are alloy rings which uh, come from Switzerland. They have individual numbers on them and the, also the zoological nomenclature for male and female which is 1.0 or 0.1 and they're gold for females and black for males right. and we just close that with a stainless steel pin there which keeps the 
the ring locked and also means that it can't be removed without permanent damage to the ring and therefore cannot be taken off and put on another bird. Right. Now while we've got the bird out here, we'll do one or two diagnostic procedures on it, um, collect some material for the laboratory diagnosis. Um, we'll start off by taking a swab from the cloaca. This will allow us to um, culture the bacteria which are in the intestine of the bird in the laboratory and check that they're normal for the bird and also in balance, quite important for the bird's basic health. So I'll just um, turn this light source down. We can hear ourselves talk better. Just slide that very gently in there and put it into the transport medium. That can go to the lab now. And we'll do the same in the bird's coena, which is the slot in the roof of the mouth where the nostrils communicate with the airway. Let's turn that off for a second as we take him out. Her, I should say. Just insert that in there. It's a small, slightly smaller human ear, nose and throat swab. That's that one. Back in here again. Just keep it lightly anaesthetized for a minute more. And the last thing we'll collect is a blood sample. This we do from the right jugular vein in the neck which is, as well as being the most accessible, is the best one to use because there's little risk of it bleeding afterwards after you've taken the sample. Bird veins are much more fragile than mammal veins and they do tend to bleed afterwards when, uh, if you don't keep pressure on for a long period of time. Just raise the vein in the neck having cleaned the skin and put a fine needle in there and just draw out a small sample. Modern laboratory techniques are very helpful for bird medicine now because they require very small samples of blood. Right. Ten years ago you didn't need to, needed ten <laughs> times this size of sample to um, do the same procedures and uh, the bird would have objected to that, I think. Yes, I think so. So, now he's, she's ready to come round. If you're ready to put her back in the box, starting to move already. Right, okay. And I'll put this into the tube. Come on then. Oh, yes, coming round nicely. Get a good grip, she'll I come to uh, very quickly. <laughs> More problems like that. Yep. Setting up pairs to breed, or simply trying to locate a single bird as an addition to your family unit can be fraught with problems. In all circumstances, it's a case of buyer beware. So, always try to buy from a reputable source. Easier said than done, but my advice is to take your time and investigate a number of possible sources before making a purchase. Obtain from your newsagent, Cajun Avery Birds and Bird Keeper to build up some foundation knowledge. Elsewhere in the world, similar publications are available, such as Bird Keeper in the USA. Another good idea is to join the Parrot Society, which not only produces a monthly magazine where most of the genuine breeders advertise their product, but also holds two major shows annually where beginners and para experts alike gather in their thousands. Birds intended for pets should always be obtained young, probably at about 12 weeks, domestically bred, hand-reared and close-banded. A certificate of hatch date and health should also be provided at purchase. Though such a bird's wild-caught counterpart will learn in time to tolerate human contact, they will never form the same bond with their owner as a captive bred specimen. In any event, taking of birds from the wild should be discouraged. The skills and care of aviculturists worldwide now providing abundant numbers of home bred birds. For pets or breeders, never purchase birds that are less than perfect in plumage and general physical condition. Look out particularly for dull eyes, runny noses, respiratory problems or plucking. Check also that the vent is clean and the bird is of good weight. 
The latter is not an easy task if the specimen is adult and nervous, but the seller should be able to correctly hold the bird whilst you check along the keel bone to ascertain the specimen is not suffering from weight loss. It should feel well covered, perhaps slightly on the plumpish side. Proven or surgically sex pairs should be just that. Today, most specimens falling into that category will be presented to the would-be purchaser with leg bands and a veterinary surgical sexing certificate. All the S's. When neither of these items are available, the word of the vendor must be accepted. Unreliable, sadly, in some cases. One must then resort to surgical or DNA sexing, which in any event is necessary when purchasing genuinely unsexed single birds for later pairing. Now your bird or birds can follow the other procedures to be found in the preceding veterinary aspects of this program. Andrew, um, what main problems do African greys suffer from, both in aviaries and, and sort of in a, in a home situation? Most of the diseases that we see that are particular to African greys seem to be nutritional in origin. Right. And I'm sure you'll discuss elsewhere in this video the problems of persuading African grey parrots to take a good varied diet. They do seem to be very picky about what they'll eat. Oh, sure. And many, many people find it very difficult to get them off anything except sunflower seed. And consequently, they do get deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And the two particular ones that seem to trouble them are vitamin A deficiency and calcium deficiency. Okay, let's have a look at vitamin A deficiency uh, as an example. Uh, how does that affect the bird and <coughs> what do those people out there watching this do to correct it? Well, <coughs> vitamin A is one of its chief responsibilities in the body is to maintain the integrity of the surfaces of the linings of the body, the inside of the nose, the inside of the gut, the mouth and so on and so forth. And when there's a vitamin A deficiency, this lining tends to become changed in nature and mm -hmm very easily under those circumstances becomes infected. So what you finish up with typically in the African grey and, and very, very rarely in other species of parrot are these abscesses that you find swelling under the mandible, under the angle of the jaw there, actually in the depth of the tongue, on the roof of the mouth and then elsewhere in the sinuses around the eyes and um, and so on, and they're quite large, hard, cheesy abscesses, and they cause the bird serious difficulties in breathing or feeding and so on. Right. And although they are, by the time they're presented to us, they're infectious, in fact, caused by bacteria, right. the basic background cause them is almost certainly a vitamin A deficiency. Yeah. Can this be pre pre prevented? Well, yes, if we can persuade the bird to take a source of vitamin A in the diet, and the typical things that one uses to get vitamin A into any diet are green leafy vegetables, carrots, the green and orange things in life um, that carry the carotene which is the pro precursor of vitamin A in the body. Right. I mean, can you uh, encourage them to absorb this by uh, putting something in the water or something like that or is that not? You can add multivitamin supplements to the diet. Um, vitamins in the water is one way of doing it, although right. they do tend to have a very short life and it's essential that they're put in fresh and changed every day. Sure. Um, vitamins on the food, if they will take some formulation of that kind, is another way of doing it. Mm -hmm. What about injections or something like that? I mean, that would well, we certainly use that for treatment. Right. And um, if any bird shows any early signs of it, we give them vitamin A injections for treatment. And, and when we treat the abscesses, which have to be removed surgically, mm -hmm. it's a minor procedure, but it has to be uh, done that way, then we give them vitamin A along with the uh, post-operative antibiotics. Okay. Right, well, that's sort of uh, fairly comprehensive, isn't it? Cost you another sixpence, madam. Okay, Andrew, so, d so how does calcium deficiency show up in uh, African greys? Well, in different ways in adults and young birds. In adults particularly, you may simply find that the bird falls off the perch having a fit oh. because the calcium in the blood level gets low mm -hmm. and this affects the brain and the nervous system. Right. And the bird will recover quite rapidly from this, but it may be repeated the following day or it may develop into a very serious, uh, consistent, right. continuous fit. Sure. 
And, and how does it show itself up in, in sort of young birds or babies? You know? In young birds, usually what happens is the bones don't calcify properly as they grow. Right. They're soft. And under the tension of the muscles and tendons growing and the weight of the bird, they bend. And even sometimes fracture like, rather like wet cardboard, more than a, like a brittle bone. So they fold and fracture and you finish up with these birds with deformed legs and wings and sometimes even the spine and the beak are affected. Right. So um, going first of all to uh, the adult birds, if we have this problem with adult birds, I mean, how do we cure it? What do we do to rectify the problem? Well, assuming that um, we're not in the serious stages of the disease, when of course we have to resort to injecting calcium and vitamin D3 and so on, right. um, just adding a good source of calcium to the diet is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And it really is necessary all year round for African greys, but especially in the breeding season when the female egg laying is making such a demand on her calcium stores to f form the shells. Right. And the best way of administrating, administering that would be? If you've got them on a soft food diet, by adding a calcium a vitamin supplement that's made for large breeds of dogs, those are the most co convenient ones that we find. Right. And that, that you, will you, do you powder that up or...? Yeah, it comes as a powder. You right. simply mix it in with the food. It, it's very high calcium content and gives them what they need. An effective way to get them to take it in, in fact. That's right. Right. And what about y in babies, you know, young birds? Well, then it's a question of, you have some control of the diet. So it's simply a question of adding a, a, a powdered calcium source to your hand-rearing diet, either ground-up cuttlefish bone or simple ca calcium lactate powder and so on, and making sure that you have a vitamin D3 source right. as well. Andrew, plucking in African greys is a major problem. It has been for me uh, for many years. I owned a, a wonderful tame pet <coughs> African grey and one morning I came down into the kitchen and had to blink twice because the thing had suddenly denuded itself. Uh, I've also had the problem with breeding pairs uh, that have suddenly, for no reason at all, you know, plucked themselves uh, so they look like something you've got out of the supermarket for Sunday lunch. Um, what's that all about? Is it psychological or what? Whatever it's about, it's certainly complicated and it, it, it may have multiple factors in its origin or it may, have, it may occur for different reasons on different occasions. We may be back to nutrition partly in this, but even birds on an apparently very good diet, as you say, successful breeding birds will do it, mm. as will the perfectly healthy pet bird when upset. Typically, people who bring pet birds in that have suddenly started plucking Something has happened in the bird's environment to disturb it. Somebody's left the home, somebody's joined the home, a new baby, a new puppy, right. a new bird, for example. It's been taken to another member of the family for a fortnight while the owner goes on holiday and come back completely stripped of feathers or <laughs> It's certainly on the way to being so. Yeah. And so obviously some kind of psychological stresses can start these birds doing this, and greys seem as certainly as susceptible as, as any species of parrot, and probably more than most, to doing this. They do seem quite sensitive to this sort of thing. But you meet other birds that are very phlegmatic and, and never <coughs> ever do it. Sure. Quite often I've had people, you know, owners of these type of birds come to me and they're more, they're more stressed out uh, with this situation than the birds themselves seem to be. And uh, they try all sorts of things. They, they try sprays and Elizabethan collars, <coughs> and nothing eventually at the end of the day seems to work. You've got to try and break the habit before it forms. Right. And sometimes you may need to resort to something drastic as an Elizabethan collar or, or the neck braces that we're using now, right. um, which just hold the, the bird's chin up like that so it can't get over the top, but right. it doesn't have this big collar around the side. Just to stop it doing it and allow the feathers time to grow because it seems as the cycle goes on the bird gets very irritated with the new growing feathers all the time right. and, and then it, it becomes a progressive cyclical problem. But it may be possible to break this cycle in simpler ways by training for example or by different handling the bird or changing the diet or changing the environment. It needs a lot of careful study each particular case. What we do notice is that quite a lot of the birds that come are around the three to four year old mark when they suddenly start doing this. And I do believe that quite a lot of these problems are associated with puberty in the birds. Right. And just as with teenagers, it, it's, it's a stage they can get through. Right. So people will come and say, my bird suddenly got very aggressive, it's shouting, it's pulling its feathers out, it's doing peculiar things. 
and it typically seems to be about the time they get to breeding age. And if they're to remain as pets and not be paired up, when of course most of these problems are immediately solved if you pair the bird up in an aviary, if they are to remain as pets, with a bit of patience, they'll, they'll get through this and they'll grow out of the troublesome stage and just become mature adult. Yes. So in a way, it could be a slightly psychological stroke sexual problem. Yes, it can be internally and externally motivated as a psychological problem, I think. It's always amazed me to watch a bird actually sort of sit and pull feathers out of itself. I mean, if you pull bits of hair out of your head or something, it's quite painful. Oh, yes. It, they seem to get to like the... Perhaps we could have supplied them all with whips and they could, you know, whip themselves instead of pulling their feathers out. Well, it's one of the most sensitive things that you, you can do to a bird is to pull its feathers out. They really, really are sensitive to that. Right. Yet, um, as you say, they'll do it to themselves with apparently gay abandon. So the answer really there is if you've got a bird that starts doing it, it's three or four years old, perhaps an ideal thing would be to pair that bird up to breed. If not, try and break its habits, try and give it a different routine, distract it. Get it, get it some toys, get it some other things that it m might not previously have had. Right, well, that's very good, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed. There are no commercial breaks or hula hula girls in this videotape. However, whilst filming at Loro Park in Tenerife, my cameraman and director Phil, the dreadful Phil and I, took the opportunity to look around the newly created Museum of Porcelain Parrots. This is a truly staggering exhibit, and while some of the items on display are modern, others are of great antiquity, like your presenter. And one can only guess the value of these. So now let's look and enjoy. All African grey parrots can prove suitable as a pet or companion bird in the house. Frequently, however, even hand-raised specimens will bond to one particular member of the family. In an attempt to negate this behaviour, it is therefore of paramount importance that all members of the household pay the bird frequent attention and frequently offer birds of love and friendship, and the odd treat won't go amiss either. As with all birds kept in the home, frequent spraying with tepid water is essential to maintain plumage condition. Another important aspect of your bird's life is its cage. This should be as large as possible, cleaned regularly and provided not only with natural wood perches, but with robust toys and other items of interest to prevent the boredom which all too frequently leads to plucking and other forms of self-abuse. All birds, well almost, have been designed by God to fly. However, in a home situation, I recommend the clipping of one wing. Do it yourself in the following manner. Take the wing and cut away the primaries. Leave the last three so that when the wing is folded back, the clipping becomes invisible. Where the bird is a wild-caught specimen, assistance may be required, but in a domestically bred bird, as I hope a yours will be, this should not be necessary. Parrots, especially those sad creatures doomed to live their lives on hardwood dowling or the even more appalling plastic perches provided by the majority of commercial parrot cage and stand manufacturers, tend to suffer from overgrown toenails and beaks. With care, however, both these problems can be attended to by the caring owner. Blood veins run down both, so it is essential to remove only the tip. Dog clippers, as seen being used here, 
are ideal for both procedures, though for claws, an emery board will do the job just fine. Where restraint is necessary, a soft towel should be employed to prevent damage both to the bird and its owner. Two final points. If you love your bird, and I'm sure you do, why not make him or her a natural wood climbing frame or stand like you see here? It's ideal for outside on a summer's day on the patio or in the plant house in winter. Lastly, if you're transporting your bird, perhaps to a holiday location or perhaps if some problem has arisen to the vet, a pet carrier such as this is ideal. Don't forget to provide food for long journeys and fruit such as orange in place of water. Of course, birds being sent for surgery should be denied both for at least eight hours. Here we are, this is the closing sequence. For the last year, I've had the pleasure of being para-expert, whatever that might mean, for a wonderful magazine called Bird Keeper. And not surprisingly, over 50% of the letters I've received uh, regarding all sorts of activity uh, concerning bird keeping, aviaries, cages and so forth, has really concerned the keeping and breeding of African greys. And so I thought it would be quite fun if we had a long today, and I always think it is quite fun to have a long today, my wife, Marianne, to ask some of those readers' questions because we couldn't have all the readers here because we couldn't have afforded the fee. So I'll go over to Marianne now and ask her some of those questions or ask her to give me some of those questions that the readers have asked. Marianne, give me a question. Why doesn't my pair breed? That's a fantastic question. Well, basically, um, people often get uh, their African greys together and they say, why don't they breed? There's, there's many reasons for that. One of the reasons can be that they're not actually... Uh, together. Together. Yes, they might not. She's doing it to me, isn't she? She's doing it to me. But the, the reason that uh, a pair of African greys may not breed, we, we can forget her, um, is, why are you doing this to me? Well, I'll do it again. Right. One pair of, one, one pair of African greys. Uh, they may not be uh, mature to breed. They may, they may not be old enough. They may not, in fact, be, be in fact, a pair. So it, it says a pair so here. It says my pair. You have a pair. It's a pair. It says yeah. my pair. A pair of birds. Yeah. Yeah, but a pair only constitutes two. Two well, you, birds. You don't know that. Well, you just said you've got a pair. I thought you were the expert. I'm not. Well, I am the expert. But if well, then answer the question. Birds, eh? Answer the question. I, I'm trying to answer the question. If you've got two birds, you've got a bird here and a bird there. You've got a boy and a girl. Yeah. You, you, but if you've watched the rest of the program, you would have seen. You know, I you didn't. need one boy and one girl. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's very good. So you really need to have one boy and one, one girl. Mm -hmm. but, but the most important thing is that you need one boy and one girl of mature sexual age in, in order to breed from them. And I mean, that's the widest question you could possibly ask because they may be located in the wrong type of aviary, they may be given the wrong diet. There's a multitude of problems, but basically speaking, African greys will breed if you've got a boy and a girl, and they're surgically sexed, and they're mature to breed. And, and they're, they're in the, the same aviary. Right, and, and they're in an aviary, yes. Together. Oh, together. Yes, they do need to be together. And, and basically, that's the so answer to your I question. Do the next question And then watch now. the rest of the programme. Yeah. Can I have the next question, please? I think so. If I want to hand rear the offspring from my birds, at what point should I take the eggs or chicks from the nest? Okay, ideally, if a pair of birds uh, successfully lay the eggs and, and, and then they uh, incubate for a period of 28, 30 days and out pops a chick, then the ideal thing is that you're going to let them stay with the parents for 8 to 10 days, maybe longer, maybe to 12 days, and then take the chick away and you can hand raise it from there. If you're going to take the egg, leave it at least for eight days so that the uh, egg will set under the parents. And what that means is that the, the, actual, um, the actual embryo will start to develop under the parents because they can do it much better than you can in an artificial incubation situation. And once you've taken it away from there, 
put it in the incubator and away you go from there. As I say, if you take the chick away, uh, leave it as long as possible. You can leave it even up to three weeks with, um, with, with, with the parent because the parents can give it a much better start than we can. You know, we're not too good at that just yet. But uh, leave it as long as possible, then take it away and hand rear it, and the bird will still be uh, growing up to be extremely hand tame in a pet situation, which, it, which it, we assume you would want to have. Let me have your next question. Can you eat parrot eggs? Can you eat parrot eggs? Well, doesn't really say uh, that actually. You can. <laughs> yeah. Well, you could eat parrot eggs. I mean, not a lot of people do that, but um, you could eat parrot eggs. But um, naturally enough, that would be a very exotic and expensive uh, breakfast. Um, stick to chickens. Or ducks. Or, 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 or in fact, ducks. Yes, yes. Or pig, pig eggs. Can I do the nice. next question now? Yeah, next question, please. You're not yes. rambling. I am rambling. Yeah. Will a hand reared bird be tame with everyone? Um, basically, um, birds grow up like people, and they 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 grow to love, you know, other people, human beings, whatever. They interact, and they interact. So, particularly with African greys, an African grey will grow up, and it will suddenly latch onto one particular person and like that person better better than anyone else. So, it isn't true to say they'll be absolutely tame with absolutely everybody. Um, What's important is that in a family situation, they are the for family, a while. Th they are yeah. for a while. Yeah, they are for a while. But um, it, it's quite important that every member of the family plays with the bird all of the time and takes it out of the cage and gives it lots of love and attention. Otherwise, it will sort of back away and start to sort of latch on, particularly to one person. And um, uh, and greys tend to do that anyway, um, a as do human beings. You know, you'll get to like one particular person. Uh, there are better species of bird, probably, um, for a flexi sort of um, interreaction situation within w within a family home. Greys are wonderful things and and, uh, and do love most people, but they'll they will definitely latch onto one person. Do all African greys talk? Indeed, they don't. Um, like people, African greys. Um, have a, they have an ability to talk, they have an ability to be the most amazing talkers of all the families here today, but not every specimen will be uh, particularly eloquent. Yeah. Did you want to say something more about that? No, no. I was waiting to see if you were, you know. If I was, didn't yes, I will. interrupt be. you. No. Oh, I, God. I mean, they can be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> they can be wonderful talkers. But, you know, people buy an African grain, they think, oh, it's fantastic, it's going to be a fantastic talker, and it's going to sing and dance and all those sort of things. And they don't all do that. They have the ability. The African grey has the ability over all other parrots to, to really, you know, do the nonsense. But not all of them will do. The truth is that from 12 weeks old, um, they will start to talk, the ones that are going to. Some will say little, some will say a great deal. So, you know, there you are. That's the answer to that question, isn't it? Sing, talk, dance. Sing, sing talk, and, dance, and, and whatever. And strip, yes. in fact, which is the next question. Yes. It's about them stripping. Stripping what? Well, they pluck, don't they? The pluckers. Yeah. Yes. My pet grey suddenly plucked itself bald. What can be done? Was that, that Mrs. Um, Mrs. Johnson of Reading? No. No, it wasn't. No. no. Yes. A, a, a plucker. Yeah. Well, with all parrots. Um, the problem we've got is that they're, they're, they're stuck in a cage, people go out to work all day, and uh, what happens is the bird sits there and it thinks, well, what do I do now? And, and like people biting their fingernails, they, they start to pluck. The other reason for plucking is because they reach sexual maturity, and once they reach sexual and pluck maturity, themselves. They, they pluck themselves <laughs> because they can't do the <laughs> other thing. Yes, exactly. I don't know what call that in America, but anyway, never mind, Silvio, but don't worry about it. But the thing is, um, what one's got to do about this is to take evasive action. Now, there's a number of things you can do here. You, you, can, you obviously got to give them toys and other things in their cages to give them... You're doing that. I will come to that in a minute. Don't worry about it. It's, not, it's okay. That um, was a prompt. A prompt. Right. I'm, I'm prompted. I'll take myself prompted. But what you've got to do is really uh, to give it some activity over and above what you would normally would, like its food, its water, and so on and so forth. Um, and 
if it does start plucking, you've either got to pair it up with another other bird because it's a sexual kind of thing uh, where they, they'll become uh, excited. And they can pluck and each other. Th 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 they can pluck each other, in fact. Um, you keep prompting me to do this, and I'll reach down here. Yeah, you'd have forgotten otherwise. Here, in fact, it's what's called an Elizabethan collar. If a bird plucks itself... Uh, it's a record. It's a record. could play that. It could be, yes. It could be a, a record, but you can't play it, really. Has it got a song on it? I don't think so. But, um, <laughs> no, if, if, if a bird is plucking itself, uh, uh, as I've said to you, it can be because um, it's sexually active or becomes sexually active and needs to breed. Um, it hasn't had enough attention and so forth. Putting the collar on, How we on, go Michael. about it, putting the collar on, yes, I've got it here. Um, how we go about it is we can, we can spray it. There are a number of sprays on the market which are bitter. You spray it on the, on the plumage and, and that's bitter. And, and, and on the tongue, it's not pleasant. Unfortunately, the birds get to like that. It's the same with people spraying that nasty stuff on their nails and biting it and they get to like it so they carry on biting their nails in, in fact until they've got you know half an arm hence Rodney wooden leg. One of the things they can do is to apply one of these as we've said. Which, which way round would you put that on a bird? Well you could put it on like this couldn't you? There's a Chinese way of putting it on like or that. the Chinese parrot. Oh, a Chinese a parrot as <laughs> non-plucker. Uh, alternatively, well, how would you you would put it on? I mean, if that was the head, you'd put it on sort of like this. And which way good, would it, it? Which way would it dome downwards or do upwards? Dome downwards. Dome, dome downwards, downwards, away from. So the that when the bird actually, you know, went down towards its plumage, it wouldn't be able to. Because on dogs and things, that. they put it with the dome outwards, don't they? Towards the snout. I, I'm not sure about dogs. Talking dogs or non-talking dogs. Plucking dogs. Oh, plucking dogs. Yes, I, I don't know about <laughs> plucking dogs. But um, so on plucking parrots, that's the way you'd actually put it on. And once that was locked up, which I can't do now because I've only got one hand and a pencil, um, that would sort of lock up on a, on a downward situation so that as the bird went, went down, it couldn't reach its plumage. Unfortunately, whilst that is absolutely wonderful in the short term, in the long term, that is not the answer. The answer is. Really it might just is break the habit, mightn't it? It helps to break the habit, but the, it's a psychological problem. And in my opinion, for what it is worth, after 20 years of parrot plucking and whatever, um, I feel that birds that start plucking are really in the situation where they want to breed and they ought to be put in breeding situations because it, it, it's, a, it's a sexual. Um, it, it's it's the denial of a sexual situation that causes that problem. I don't Other do than it. that, it can, it can also... <laughs> can we do the next question? You, no, because I, this is very important. It can also be uh, a problem from the liver. There can be a liver problem which causes, uh, causes plucking, and that comes into the veterinary section, which we won't go into. So we'll go on to the next question. You're pleased about that. How yeah. many times a year will Grace go to this? Greys go to nest. Right, African greys. Well, I've had pairs of birds which can breed once a year or constantly and just breed, you know, just one after the other. Like people, you know, you get those people um, that, that just breed all the time. And, and African greys certainly are like that and they'll, they'll just go on breeding and breeding and breeding. And it's quite wrong and cruel, of course, to take away the nest box, which well, some people say, well, they're going to take the nest box that's away. That's part of the sec the, this Seventh question, Seventh should question. I leave the nest box in all year round? And you're sort of answering that now at the same time. Yeah, I'm answering that question. That's from uh, Mrs. Uh, Woodenleg of uh, China. No, well, it's not. No, it's not. No. <laughs> well, the, the fact of the matter is, always leave the nest box in for African greys because they, they like to hide away, as we've said in other parts of the programme, they like to hide away, they need to go into the nest box, but they will, they will breed constantly. Not all pairs will breed constantly, but they ought to have the facility to be able to do so. African greys come from a tropical climate. Do I need to heat my aviaries? You don't need to heat your aviaries. Um, we're, we've quite happily kept tropical birds of all types, you know, macaws, cockatoos, Amazons, African greys and so forth. I know. Even outside <laughs> aviaries, you know. <laughs> I was there. Um, you were there at the time. <laughs> But they quite happily be outside. I just feel 
and it's been proven by breeding results that if you uh, put a bird into a, into a situation where it's it's protected from inclement weather, then then the results for breeding and its general condition will be enhanced by that situation. I, I don't think it's rather like walking out uh, into the street with a, without your overcoat. You know, you will survive, but you'll be bloody cold. Well, but if you've got the overcoat hot. on, you'd it's much better. If, eh? if it was the summer, you'd be hot. Well, uh, yes, I suppose if it was the summer, or we were in Tenerife, where we my are, bloody old we? wanky <laughs> film cameraman was, <laughs> we, we'd be much happier. But that's, the, that's, that's the last question. That, that, that was the last question, You can stop it? now. I'm quite pleased about that, really. Well, there we are. Right, now, there we are. We've done some questions which, um, which uh, my uh, readers have asked me. I suppose we uh, might well have covered it previously, but now you've had it covered again. And there's one final thing that I want... Do you want to see my plucked parrot? You your plucked parrot? My, my plucked parrot test. Your plucked parrot test? My plucked parrot test. Could you... What's that? Have you been drinking? I haven't... Never have been. <laughs> No, <laughs> I've had drink for about your um, nose is growing. two years. Do you want to see my black parrot? Can no. I see your black parrot? Do you want to? Yes, can I see the black parrot? We need the black, black parrot well, test. This, this is a good way to tell if your parrot's been plucking itself too much and if you need help. And you have to take a towel, and it helps if it's a pink towel. And you roll up one end quite tightly, down towards the middle, am I about the middle? You're about in the middle so. there now, yes. And you take the other end. This is a bit of a tatty towel, but it doesn't matter, because it will be a parrot in a minute. And you roll it up to about the middle. And then you go like this, see? Like that. And then you get each of the corners, and you give them a tug. Like that. Whoops, I lost one there. Like that. Uh, if this goes wrong, it will be really embarrassing. But if it works, you'll see what to do if you've got a plucked parrot. Because you go like that. And if your African grey looks like this, you have a very serious problem indeed. Thank you very much. It that worked. Is, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, um, yes, that's what you call a plucked African grey. Can I go now? And uh, No, you can't. <laughs> you can't go now because what I need now is that clipboard back. Oh, because you need to read the last bit. And finally, at, at the end of all this, when we'll throw these readers' questions away, but not the readers, I would like to alert you to one thing. Whilst we've been making... <laughs> yes, I'll do that again. You have been I drinking. I often do. I have. <laughs> yes, I have been drinking, but not very much. Uh, whilst we've been making this series of... Uh, uh, tapes on the care and breeding of parrots in captivity. We've had the immense pleasure to be uh, associated with Loro Park in Tenerife, and they've given us lots of help, and it's been a wonderful thing. Loro Park also do something else that's wonderful. They've uh, made up something called a foundation, and that foundation has been giving hundreds of thousands of dollars, and seriously, hundreds of thousands of dollars to people that are going out into the wild, um, researching um, the difficulties these birds are having, and they've been um, funding all sorts of uh, necessary research. So I would like to say to you, and you can get one of these little brochures at a later date, um, this is the um, SOS, you see, Save Our Sods, or whatever it's called. Uh, souls. Souls, souls. Oh, souls. It's souls. It's Save Our Souls. But anyway, um, oh, and I've dropped that, but never mind. Don't worry. I'm dropping everything now. It's a very good idea if you were to uh, join up with the Laura, Cla uh, Laura Park Foundation. And one of these little leaflets you will be able to get by writing to the address at the end of this program. And the reason you should do that is because they, more than anyone else on the planet, are saving the birds that you can enjoy in your home. And there you go. Enough of that. Thank you very much.
can't see. I can't see anything about the, on the monitor from here. Oh. You're looking, you're looking beside your folder as well. 